So how is everybody, how's everybody doing um, so far in this? Some, some thumbs, anything? It's, uh, it's intense. I'm hearing a lot of uh, very, very similar kind of uh, requests that maybe this weekend take a little bit extra time to do the module, which is totally fine. Um, we understand that it is an intense course. And originally it was supposed to be 21 days. And now we've pushed it to 28, so there is still a little bit of leeway, but uh, we understand that this is a lot of reading on your own and a lot of PowerPoints and lectures and videos. I'm still making PowerPoints available for you guys to be able to pull up, um, as well as posting them on that YouTube channel for you guys to be able to download and watch later. It makes it a lot easier if you're having to to fly somewhere or do something like that, you can download it and watch later. Because I, I know I, I know people still want to do uh, stuff besides work and school, so still working on a lot of that. Uh, this chapter is a good chunk of information. Uh, so the the biggest of our skills is our patient assessment, but this here covers so much medical information. Uh, there might there, there's a lot of information you have to kind of retain or memorize certain facts, um, key terms and definitions that can be kind of uh, intense to remember. There is at least two PowerPoints available for you guys. Let's see here. Uh, so I know when you guys go to your your course announcements, you can see where like the, the YouTube and stuff are, you're able to see. Um, I, this uh, blog here that Adam shared is actually pretty neat about doing CPR in space and I figured uh, he wanted to share that and I would share that with you guys. Um, and then you've got, let's see, course home. The two PowerPoints that I made for you guys for this module is gonna be your chapter two, the diabetes and altered mental status. Know the difference in your type one and your type two diabetics. They are um, not the same. You will treat them kind of differently because one is more uh, an autoimmune disorder and the other one is usually due to genetic or dietary or weight factors. Uh, and then there is many different causes for altered level of consciousness. And that's what that AMS is, is altered mental status. And you guys will look into, a lot of places don't use AEIOU tips anymore, but it's one of the common um, like abbreviations that, that you can look up like on Google and stuff to look into causes of altered mental status. Um, basically anything that fits into the AEIOU tips is some sort of cause that would make somebody go unconscious or loopy, confused. So AEIOU tips, which is usually like alcohol, epilepsy, infection, uremia, um, oxygenation, trauma, insulin, psychosis or poisoning, and then stroke, seizure. There's a bunch of different uh, like letters that people put in there. Uh, but that's kind of the gist of it. You go to somebody, they're unconscious, and you got to rule out, have they had a diabetic problem? Let's look for some history. Have they been poisoned? Is there a scene safety issue? Do they look like there's been some trauma? Did they have a seizure? Uh, so just ruling things out using those AEIOU tips. Um, and then chapter 27, so I don't have any of the in-between, but we'll cover the in-between chapters here. Uh, chapter 27 is on behavioral emergencies, and there is a difference between behavior and uh, psychosis, and it will kind of talk about those two different um, definitions, as well as how we're going to treat those patients. Um, we never assume that all people that have um, behavioral history or some kind of mental health history that they're not having a medical issue. So always look into a medical issue that could be causing the, uh, the psychosis or behavioral. So chapter 22 and 27 are available for you guys there. Um, there's also a thing here on uh, street drugs. If you guys didn't look at it, um, it goes over the different 
drugs that could cause altered level of consciousness. Um, so what I want to talk to you guys about is um, your, hold on, I printed it out. I'm at work, so hold on. I can't tell I'm back on the slip, so I got a lot of different uh, computers in front of me. Uh, I made some notes on the important things of your uh, chapter 22. You guys need to know your uh, three P's of diabetes, which is going to be your polydipsia, polyuria, and polyphagia, which is, uh, polydipsia is going to be a lot of drinking. Uh, it I cover it in the PowerPoint about why they drink so much. Polyuria is um, increased urination, which kind of goes with your drinking a lot. And I cover why they're, they're doing both of those in the PowerPoint. And then the eating a lot. Anything that has the, the PHAG, like uh, phagocytes are um, different cells in the body that they're white blood cells that eat. So anything that has the um, PHAG, um, medical terminology in there is usually about eating. So the poly, polyphagia is, or I guess it would be phagia. I don't speak Latin, close enough. Um, it is uh, overeating. Uh, so again, look at those uh, PowerPoints and remember those three. That'll determine um, a lot of your type one, type two diabetic, and then versus your hypo and your hyperglycemic patients. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about um, some sepsis and infection. Sepsis and infection is usually going to uh, take a little bit of time. Diseases need time to incubate and grow into your body. So if you start seeing questions about how a patient is acting abnormal, they're 80 something years old, they have a history of like dementia, but this is a sudden change. Um, dementia is even slower than an infection. Uh, people that are geriatric are not as likely to show signs and symptoms of a fever like we would. We're, we're, gonna, we're gonna have a temperature, we're gonna be fighting it off and creating a lot of heat in our body, um, trying to fight it off. Uh, the elder population is not going to be able to create that kind of heat. So they go from grandpa's just a little wobbly and he's kind of losing his mind a little bit to he is absolutely off his rocker today. Nothing's making sense. I think some sort of infection or sepsis. So sepsis is when it's starting to affect more than one body system. So you have an infection in your leg but then that infection gets into the blood. So it's no longer in the soft tissue. Now it's entered the bloodstream and they start getting um, infections in other areas of the body. When you go into septic shock is when you actually are unable to maintain a good blood pressure or heart rate. And basically you start to get shocky. Um, with septic shock, our body will kind of um, dilate to where we lose that that blood pressure. So the pump's working, there's enough volume, but the tank got a lot bigger. So your blood vessels have just opened up and, and dumped your, your blood pressure. You'll see that in your septic shock. There's not a whole lot we can do. What they need is some seriously strong antibiotics. Uh, we need to transport them um, as comfortably as we can, try to keep their temperature down if we can, um, and get them to a hospital where they can get the antibiotics. We need to rule out other things. So there could be an infection, but we need to make sure that we do rule out blood sugar, trauma, uh, drugs, alcohol, anything like that. So don't just get stuck on, um, yeah, he's got a cut on his leg and he's acting loopy, and then you just leave it like that. And what actually happened is his, his, the cut on his leg wasn't as bad, but he actually had a blood, blood sugar issue. So always look for those. Um, I've got notes. Hold on. I'm with it today. So 
Infectious diseases are called um, pathogens, pathogens or pathologies, anything that has a disease or causes a disease. Um, there's bacteria, which is like single celled little organisms. Um, viruses, they require a host. They can't reproduce anywhere except for a host. And I'm pretty sure we've been kind of virused out at this point. Um, fungus are plant-like microorganisms. Um, so they usually have to move from one source to another, like the wind uh, taking them, those type things. So it is kind of like a plant. Um, protozoas are more single-celled organisms, but they're capable of more movement. They can go through water and then get up into um, a host. So think of it like um, they're in the soil and you step in some soil and you have a cut in your leg and it can go in or you're in the water and it can go into different orifices that you might have um, that's going to be more of your protozoans i don't know if you guys watch any monsters inside me but it will make you never want to go on vacation anywhere else in the world i, uh, I used to watch those back in the day when i was younger yeah not the best idea <laughs> i love those shows they, they creep me out <laughs> Um, you guys have any questions so far on what I have covered? No? Okay. Um, I do have an interesting story about um, infection. Uh, this is a real, true, scary patient that I had, and I will always remember this as one of my altered level conscious things that I rule out. Um, I was paged out to a lady that was just not acting right when we got on scene. She was sitting on a bucket in the bathroom and this bucket was not right side up so it wasn't like a bucket it was more like a bucket um, and she was defecating all over it um, her son had said that uh, she had started acting bizarre earlier that day was eating dirt um, she tried eating the cell phone she was like trying to bite them um, both of her kids so he called the, the ambulance and we showed up. When we got there, she didn't look like at us. She looked like through us as if we like weren't really there. And then she charged at us trying to bite us. The, the son said that she's normally not able to walk, that she has um, recently broken her ankles and she hasn't gone through enough physical therapy yet. Uh, so she wasn't supposed to be walking, but she sure as heck ran right towards us. Um, after a while, we were able to kind of hog tie her into the, the chair, um, and like it took four of us to keep her kind of down from the chair, and me being the EMT1 brand new, um, I kind of got stuck in the back with her. Um, she didn't just eat dirt, she actually ate um, feces, and it was in her teeth, and the only way I could keep her calm was to hold her hands, um, out of reach of where she couldn't bite me and like talk to her about this close to her face. So I kept <laughs> trying to breathe, um, but what I could see was not pleasant in her mouth and it was just a horrible ride to the hospital. Um, we did what we could to try to calm her down. That was the only way to keep her calm. We didn't get much for vitals on her. I got a blood pressure on her ankle. Otherwise she was warm, pink and dry. She was upright looking around, so I had to just assume that her vitals were pretty normal. She didn't want us to do anything else with her. Um, a day later, I got a call from the hospital and I had to go in and take prophylactics because she had bacterial meningitis and she died. So meningitis is crazy. This lady went from like normal to that shit with poop and dirt and then died a day later. Like, I don't know how long she had been sick for, but uh, bacterial meningitis is the one that's gonna kill people more likely. A lot of people think that viruses are deadlier, but viral meningitis is not, not nearly as um, fatal as bacterial meningitis. Uh, the meninges are pretty well protected in your spinal cord. Um, it's basically the like the fluidy area that protects your brain and protects your spinal cord. There's usually a barrier. Not a whole lot can get into um, that fluid. So once something foreign does get in there, it's really hard to kill and get out. Um, but I will remember 
an altered level of consciousness patient, I will always assume and treat for meningitis and protect myself. Um, because it is one of those where you should have, you should wear a mask and protect yourself from that kind of, uh, from that kind of illness. And I've had more than one meningitis, but that is definitely a memorable one. So with bacterial meningitis, isn't that the one where most people end up getting amputated compared to viral? I don't know about amputated, but I know that it's, it's more fatal. Um, you can actually even have like parasitic meningitis, which is super rare. Viral meningitis, usually they can recover and there might be some more like uh, neurological side effects of it because it gets in the neck. These people will typically have like a headache and unable to like move their neck around. Um, babies will get um, meningitis. They give a meningitis vaccine out for, for college age students now. Um, I was just out of college when they started kind of implementing that or just getting through the college thing so I didn't have to deal with that. So I don't know all about the vaccine of, for meningitis, but uh, all from I know is they'll have fever, sick symptoms, they're gonna act weird. We, we uh, try to treat their sugars, we try to treat oxygenation and other things, and there's nothing else left except some sort of infection. The big thing is protect yourself. That's the big takeaway from there because that is not a way I want to be presenting uh, to an ambulance if it gets called for me. Um, Ashley, do you know about bacteria um, I or believe, viral? I believe Jesse is correct. That is the one um, that they typically um, will amputate limbs and stuff because it goes like gangrene. Angry. I'm trying to look it up now for just to be positive, but I, I do believe she is correct. I was just curious because you know, like, seen a lot of house and then like a lot of like the medical TV shows and a lot of times when they reference meningitis, um, it's usually bacterial and then that's when like someone loses a limb or they lose all of them and like the worst case scenario. I was just, I was just curious. Everybody has meningitis or Guillain-Barre. Yeah. <laughs> She's not kidding. Well, I mean, um, if House was here, he would have solved the COVID thing by now. A couple people would have died, but he probably would have solved it by now. Oh, yeah. He would have treated it for sure. <laughs> um, I have an interesting story. It's not my story personally, but we had an altered mental status patient in town a couple months back when I first started at the fire department. Um, one, of the, one of the guys that was getting coffee on Main Street and everyone was staring at this guy down the road and they're like, what's going on? He was standing in the road, staring down at the gutter, staring, like screaming down into the gutter, <laughs> the gutter system and just like, waving his hands and all of that and everyone's like what's on what's going on i don't know not my problem <laughs> but um he ended up being caught on video camera dragging a trash bag to like a seated area digging through it and started to eat stuff in the trash bag Whoa. yeah we have one of those in downtown palmer i caught him yelling at a dumpster fighting with the dumpster and I see him every day in the same spot. So I'm not sure what's going on with him. He might be more of a uh, chapter 27 patient. Uh, any questions on infectious disease and sepsis? The big things there is going to be um, knowing that pediatrics and geriatrics might not be able to have the same symptoms, signs and symptoms that we would have uh, being uh, like young or middle adult and uh, being able to have normal temperatures and be able to fight this um, uh, like immune or immune system uh, is 
Good. Wow. I just kind of stopped talking there. I don't have any AIU tips, believe me. Um, along with the immune system when it comes to infectious uh, diseases is allergy. Allergy is basically an immune system gone haywire. So our normal immune system is going to work at fighting infections, bacteria, protozoans, viruses. Um, when our body attacks something at a level 10 or like warp speed, um, that's when we start having an anaphylactic reaction. So the chapter 23 goes over uh, allergic reactions. It's essentially just an excessive response to an allergen by our own body. Um, there's different chemicals that carry your immune, um, immune system. So the big one that everybody remembers is um, histamines, but there's also uh, leukotrienes that communicate the allergen to the rest of the body. Um, what your body is trying to do is fight it off, but it's, it's not normally a, a something that needs to be fought off, so it starts to fight itself. And you'll see this in um, sort of outward appearance. Some sort of thing is going to happen on the outside. So it's an internal battle. It's not because of something that's happened on the outside. Yes, they were, they were responding something from the outside, but the actual allergic reaction is an internal battle, if that makes any sense. It's our own body attacking itself because of that influence. Um, what we're concerned about when we talked about this, when we talked about the epi, is the anaphylactic patients. When we start having angioedema, and angioedema is going to be like your lips, your tongue, your mouth, when you start having that, you'll have airway compromise. And if you don't have an airway, then you don't have the ability to continue life. Uh, time is critical. Uh, we need to act more quickly than when the, re the reaction itself. Uh, they usually say that anything at the 30 minute mark or faster is a severe acute reaction. It also depends on what you're being exposed to. So we talked earlier about medications going into the stomach and it taking a while to get through. So if I have an allergy to something that I've eaten, it could react within 15, 20, even 30 minutes, and I can continue to react to it as it continues to get digested through my body. Um, it's one of the most common things that people are allergic to, that and plants. Uh, so the allergen itself, can determine how fast somebody is going to respond to it, and then people's own immune system is going to determine how fast they're gonna to respond to it. So try to determine what it was and if, it's, if it still could possibly be affecting them. So if it's food, it may go on for a while. If it's a medication, it could go on for days, because some medications actually will take like a slow release to get through the body. So if they're allergic to something that is a 12 hour response, they may have this allergic reaction for the next 12 hours. So getting an, at, um, an accurate history is going to be how you're going to determine whether they need the epi, like now if you need to get them to the hospital so they can get more epi, if they're gonna need to go to the hospital so they can get Benadryl, those type things. Um, if your patient can't talk due to swelling in the face, you have to react immediately. Start digging through pockets. It's implied consent. So we talked about it consent before. If somebody's unable to talk and their face is all swollen up, you can assume that they want help. Start digging through purses and pockets and find the EpiPen. Um, if you do take a woofer class, which is a um, wildlife first responder course, they do teach you that there is more than one epi dose in an epi pen, um, but typically epi pens are prescribed in a multi dose. It's usually two pens in one kit. Uh, because what I talked about before, you can have an allergic reaction and then the epi wears off, so then you need that second epinephrine um, injection. When we talk about um, different causes. 
We also need to consider uh, bites and stings from insects. We're getting more and more insects here in Alaska and more, more of them are gonna bite and sting. Hopefully we don't get the, uh, the murder hornets, but there are some insects that when they sting, they can continue to sting. Um, most of the time the insect, what causes them or how they sting is they'll have like a hollow spine and then the toxin can actually go through the spine and inject into you. If they are unable to sting you more than once, usually the stinger or their spine will kind of be ripped out when they, when they are done stinging you and they leave and they will eventually die. But now you have a stinger stuck in your body that's continually injecting that toxin. So anybody know the best way to, uh, to get rid of a stinger when it's in somebody's skin? Credit card. Yep, they like money. No, um, tweezers. Uh, credit card's gonna be the best. So the tweezers, if you accidentally pinch off the end, you can take off what you can see and then you won't be able to, uh, to get what's down below. So they actually uh, recommend using like a credit card or some sort of um, kind of flat, rigid um, ID, something like that that's very thin and rigid to be able to get underneath it and, and flick it out. Um, if you can't get the whole thing out, assume that it's going to continue pumping in the toxin. Thankfully, we don't have a whole lot of insects that bite, but we do have them here, and uh, we have to be prepared to be able to help people out. Uh, what's the first thing you should consider when you have somebody that is dealing with uh, an allergic reaction? Uh, make sure they have an open airway. Before that. Up and up. Not before that. If somebody's having an allergic reaction, you might have an allergic reaction to whatever they're experiencing as well. So always consider your safety because you might not have an allergy to the thing at first. Um, you can develop this allergy at any point. So always look for the bees. Um, always look to, if they're having an allergic reaction, what is it that they're allergic to before you approach the scene? so you can get an idea of what the hazard is. So always remember if they're allergic to it, you may be allergic to it as well, and it is not kosher to steal their EpiPen. Um, you guys know the difference between the a wheel, so W-H-E-A-L, and hives. They're different, but they are commonly um, seen in allergic reactions. Who can tell me which one's which? Anybody, anybody? Let's see if I can see a picture of a wheel. So a wheel is gonna be an area that you can blanch when you poke on it, it'll kind of flatten out and uh, turn white. Um, It'll also be hard, it kind of looks like a mosquito bite. It'll be hard, raised area. Um, it's well-defined on the skin. It's usually from a bite, uh, part of an allergic reaction. Um, the hives are going to be, um, sorry. They can be more like spread out, take over the body, um, a lot smaller, more like pinpoint um, size. See if I can show a picture of hives versus wheel. All right, hives are also known as Uticaria. Is that you, Ben? Yeah, um, that's me. Usually hives will itch. All right, so here's a picture of hives. My, my pager is off. So I think you guys can see this here. This here is a picture of um, 
of hives, also known as Eudicaria. And then it is not the same thing as wheels. Where was it? So you can see how these here, see if it comes up, are more hard. They're kind of white, they're more pronounced, um, and they're more uh, like raised, swollen areas that are more well defined. You start seeing that and it's not, that doesn't scare me nearly as much as somebody with anaphylaxis or, or swelling in their airways. Um, a lot of the times those people just need some uh, solumedrol, they're gonna need some uh, steroids, uh, Benadryl, so it's some diphenhydramine, that kind of stuff will stop some of the itching. What you can do uh, sometimes is you can put a, um, like some ice on it, it kind of will decrease some of the itching and it kind of gives them a little bit more comfort. A lot of people describe hives as not just itching but burning and so the thought is that there could be some um, kind of vasoconstriction to uh, kind of release some of that, that histamine response. It also promotes circulation, which means the circulation will go through and get rid of whatever the, uh, the allergen is. Uh, and then it kind of alleviates some of that itching and burning sensation. So consider giving some ice on the area where there's um, hives. Uh, to kind of allow some of that comfort. Any uh, cool stories on allergic reaction that you guys can think of? Anybody has? They some? suck. <laughs> they suck completely. <laughs> they do suck. <laughs> I, I have a very vivid childhood memory of hiding from the doctors when they're trying to give me antihistamines with a severe allergic reaction. My mom had to drag me out from under a chair that I was clinging to. Mm. <laughs> All because of strawberries. Mm. That's unfortunate. Yeah. I had a patient one time who she became allergic to her medication that she had been on for 25 years. Um, and she, when we got there, she was in what I call the reverse tripod. So she was leaning up against a, um, a recliner with her head back, trying to open up the airway that way. She just did not have the energy to hold herself up in the tripod position. Um, and your patients will do that. Um, you know, if they have been working to breathe, it's exhausting. And they will put themselves in the easiest position they can to open up their airway. And, but, and I didn't hear any wheezing whatsoever. Um, but she had hives and we could tell that, you know, her blood pressure was in the tank. We couldn't even get it by palp. It was so low. Um, and then we ended up giving her Epi, Benadryl, Zolimedrol, and she started to wheeze. And it, at first I was like, oh crap, she's getting worse. But then I realized she's, I'm actually opening her up. She was so far down that she wasn't producing wheezing because she didn't have enough air movement. And when I gave her the epi, it started to work and started to open up her airway. And so that started to produce the wheezing. And then eventually she opened up enough that the wheezing had stopped. Um, and I think it's a good takeaway because in the EMT1 books, or at least mine, um, it never said that your patient can stop wheezing, but they're still having an allergic reaction. They're still clamping down. Um, so just keep that in mind if you guys ever have a patient who's in anaphylaxis. You didn't do anything wrong. You're just finally opening them up enough to produce that wheeze. Yeah, she was just so tight she couldn't get that air yeah. in or out. Those are the scary ones. Yep. And, and you'll see like patients who are just so exhausted from trying to breathe um, that you know, they, they won't look at you. They can barely move their arms. They're just so tired. And so pay attention to those little clues. So where would you hear wheezes? Anybody have the a guess? The upper airway. The upper airway. 
Upper or lower? Lower. Upper. Lower. Where would you hear Strider? Upper. 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 So Strider, you're going to hear more in the throat. Um, it's actually going to be more probably in the lower airways for your your wheezes because you have to think. I mean, you've got alveoli all throughout, um, but it's considered more of a lower airway sound um, depending on how deep their, their wheezes are at or if there's other um, like fluid buildup or anything like that for the wheezes. So what's happening is when you have an allergic reaction, your bronchioles will, will um, constrict so air can't get out and their blood vessels will dilate. So they'll have a crappy blood pressure and they're not gonna be able to breathe. Work of breathing, we talked about this before, the actual like inhaling is an active process. Your diaphragm contracts, it brings the air in. And normally when we exhale, it's a very relaxing, no effort um, into it. When people have uh, respiratory difficulties, they start having like an asthma attack or anaphylaxis, it flip-flops. It's a lot easier to breathe in than it is to breathe out. They're no longer able to breathe out and they gotta force it out. Um, so looking at those patients that are trying to get the air out, keep their airways open, they're working really hard because something that used to be like, like no work, no effort at all, now they're having to work. So they're working both in and out and they can, um, get exhausted really quickly. So what causes the strider? Constriction in the larynx. The larynx, um, it could be um, anywhere in the oral pharyngeal airway or the upper bronchioles. It's just a, another constriction of the airway or blockage of some sort. Um, how does epinephrine work how is it a magical fix-all for your allergic reaction? It's a bronchodilator. Bronchodilator. What else does it do? Well, it triggers the sympathetic nervous system, which does all kinds of things, but one of them is bronchodilator, vasoconstrictor. So those are, our, those are two of our symptoms of an allergic reaction is vasodilation and bronchoconstriction. So epi works in the reverse. It vasoconstricts and it bronchodilates. The problem with that be is it also works on the speed of the heart. Um, so we don't want to necessarily take somebody that is has some sort of cardiac compromise. They're elderly, they've had heart issues or high blood pressure and give them a bunch of epi if they don't need it. But there is no contraindication for epinephrine in, in anaphylaxis. A person will die without the epinephrine if their airway closes. So just be aware that it does vasoconstrict and it bronchodilates, but it doesn't treat the allergy. It just treats the symptoms. So if your allergy is going to continue to affect them, you may need more epinephrine or they need to be uh, treated with other medications by taking them to the hospital. Any comments, questions, or anything on allergic reaction, chapter 23? Nope. All right. Chapter 25 is poisoning and overdose emergencies. Um, this one here is essentially, it goes over like activated charcoal, which we talked about before in last module. It's uh, know the different routes of how poisons can enter your body. So ingestion, whether you eat it, um, inhalation, so smoking, um, inhaling a other substance, um, be aware of like know your smoke inhalation injuries. Uh, it'll talk about different smoke inhalations and CO poisoning. Um, injections going to be uh, like stings or needle pokes and then uh, um, absorption through like the top of the skin. So lotions and soaps and powders. Uh, will actually penetrate through the skin. There are few antidotes available for poisonings. Um, most of the time treatment is geared towards uh, prevention. So there's a lot of uh, 
precautions with administrative protocols, um, engineering controls, PPEs, um, a lot of training with hazardous materials, those type things, because there's not a whole lot of antidotes, it's more preventing the poison itself. Uh, the poison control number is a really easy number to memorize. It is 1-800-222-1222. If you have a patient that has had some sort of poisoning or toxin, call that number because they will tell you more about it than any EMT book is ever going to tell you. And it'll be faster than actually looking it up in uh, wherever the SDS is. Um, getting the information from poison control, they'll be able to tell you exactly how to treat it and how about how much, how much time should be treated. Uh, activate a chart call. Um, what does it mean by having online medical direction? You're on the phone or the radio with your medical director getting approval and instructions. So what do you what do you need to get from your medical director or that doctor? What kind of information do you need to be able to do online medical direction? Well, yeah, yeah I guess I don't understand. Um, the name of the physician, and you need to get the name of the medication or what med it is that they want, the dose that they want, the route that they want, and you're going to confirm all of it back. But you need to have the name of the physician that is giving you that order so you can document it later. Um, who can tell me the opiate triad? I'll tell you tomorrow. <laughs> Anybody? Any takers? How does it affect your pupils? Opiates. Constricts. Opiates constrict them. Constrict your pupils. What does it do to your respirations? Slows it down. So Slows it down. Sympathetic, right? So how does it affect your mental status? Makes you uh, want to feed and breathe. Go unconscious and go sleepy. So if you find somebody that's got the constricted pupils, decreased respirations, altered level of consciousness, we can start ruling out whether they have uh, a narcotic or opiate overdose. Um, that's going to be one of the more common and common poisoning and overdose calls you're going to see in EMS uh, if you work in any like rural service. Uh, we see a lot of that. Uh, in the valley, we see a lot of it, um, more so than we used to. And it's just kind of on the rise, uh, currently nationwide. Uh, there are a lot of treatment facilities that are free. So if you guys know anybody or if you have any um, drug issues, you can find uh, different treatments online that are free. A lot of companies will support you in your decision to get clean. It's better to come clean than to get caught uh, in most cases. Any questions on poisoning and overdose? Any interesting stories or anything? How much are we gonna need to know? I haven't done the homework or the quizzes yet. How much are we gonna need to know about the differences between the narcotics and what they do, the opiates and what they do? So the narcotics and the opiates should be like almost one and the same, it, depending on like opiates versus opioids, ones like synthetic. Um, you need to know the difference between like your, your sympathetic and your parasympathetic poisons. Um, so if somebody is poisoned with like farm fertilizing equipment, it puts the body into a parasympathetic overdrive, which uh, parasympathetic system, you want to rest, digest, eat. So think of when you eat, you salivate. So if it's going to put in overdrive, you're going to salivate a lot. You're going to be gushing out. Um, you're also going to gush out your other end because it's all about digestion. So if you get poisoned with fertilizer, you're going to be 
um, kind of leaking all over the place and acting bizarre. Teary, drippy, everything is, they call it sludge. Um, and I can't remember what all of the uh, acronyms are. I can look it up real quick. But you need to know which ones are going to be parasympathetic and which ones are going to be sympathetic. So sympathetic being um, your increased heart rate, your fight and flight. Uh, all right, so sludge. So salivation, lacrimation, urination, defecation, and gastro, um, gastrointestinal distress and emesis. So basically everything is wanting to leak and come out. That's going to be your parasympathetic overdrive. Um, you can get that from, uh, there's nerve agents that will do that. Uh, so hopefully we don't have any nerve uh, gas or nerve agents that will cause that. When you see a lot of uh, like raids and stuff where they've got uh, like a some sort of paramilitary police attack with some sort of nerve gas, a lot of times it makes people snotty and, and goopy. A lot of it is a parasympathetic response. So you guys need to be, you need to know how that's going to react. So know the difference between parasympathetic and sympathetic, and then know the different ways that poisons can enter the body. Ingestion, inhalation, injection, and absorption. Those are the big takeaways from your poisoning and overdose chapters. Um, besides the, like treat airway breathing circulation and uh, scene safety. So. Anything else? Any other questions? We got abdominal injuries. You can have, a, there's so much space in your, in your abdomen. Um, there is many different causes. Some of them can have very um, severe conditions. Um, this is where you can have some uh, gynecologic emergencies. Uh, depending on the uh, gender of your patient. Um, some gynecologic emergencies can be life-threatening. Uh, anybody know the uh, pregnancy that is life-threatening and needs to be basically terminated? Uh, tubal pregnancy, right? I don't um, know what it's called, but... Uh, yeah, ectopic pregnancy. It's going to actually be up near the near the ovaries, up in the fallopian tube. So the as the as the uh, embryo grows, it'll actually kind of rip that open, and it's very vascular, and um, the mother will will die, and the the fetus will never be viable because there's nowhere for it to grow, um, and so that is a definite uh, life threat. So what kind of questions do you want to ask anybody that's got abdominal symptoms? Are you pregnant? Are you pregnant? And don't believe them. No, I'm just kidding. I just I delivered um, what did a baby. You eat that... In your last oral intake, like what was the last thing you ate? Last thing that you ate. Um, any chance you're pregnant? Are you on birth control? If you weren't pregnant. Those are questions that you want to ask every female of um, like gestation age. I ask if they're pregnant and uh, I always in the back of my mind will assume that they could always be pregnant because I delivered a baby on somebody that was adamant that she was not pregnant. Um, you need to know the types of organs that are inside your abdomen and what the differences are. So you need to know that there is hollow organs and the hollow organs can bleed quite a bit. They can also leak whatever fluid might be inside of them. So that's going to be your, um, your appendix, your bladder, your gallbladder, your intestines, um, your stomach and your fallopian tubes. So whatever is inside may come out um, as well as they can be punctured and leak. The solid organs um, is your kidney, your liver, your ovaries, your pancreas, and your spleen. Those can actually be fractured or sliced and they could bleed a lot. Uh, a splenic bleed or your spleen um, can bleed a significant amount because that's what it does is it filters, filters through. 
Um, same thing with your liver. There is a lot of um, filtering done in your liver. Your kidneys do a lot of filtering, but more in the urine aspect as opposed to um, blood. They're still very vascular. You can live with one kidney, but you can't live without any kidneys. I mean, you can do dialysis for a while, but you need to have some sort of uh, filtering of your urine, otherwise you become uh, toxic on the inside. The last type of structure is your vascular structures, which is your aorta, so your abdominal aorta, and your inferior vena cava. The inferior vena cava is the big vein headed back up to the heart, and the abdominal aorta is the, the large um, artery that's headed down. Uh, I believe it mentions in there um, a triple A, which is an um, abdominal aortic aneurysm, which it will tell you not to, to stress this person out. If you palpate the abdomen and you feel a, like a pulse, um, you need to drive fast because uh, an aortic aneurysm can rupture at any moment. Um, basically, it is a tear in the wall of the aorta and the aorta is about the size of your thumb. And that is a significant amount of bleeding that person's going to do in uh, just a few minutes if it does rupture. So try to keep them from bending or moving. Don't poke or prod it anymore. A lot of times they'll describe it as a ripping or tearing. Um, and when it does eventually tear, uh, it's like a 10% success rate on the operating ta table. Like once they start to rupture, it is like very minimal chance of survival, um, even on the operating table. So know what the, uh, the AAA is. Um, there's a lot of different complications that can cause abdominal pain because we've got a lot of organs in there. A lot of medical histories can happen. Um, ask about their last bowel movement. It's a little awkward the first few times you ask so how somebody is um, pooping, like the quality of it, the, the color, if it's normal. Um, it gets easier. Um, ask about like the consistency. Do they have watery stools? Is it, uh, is it brown or green or abnormal color? Uh, is there any blood in it? That is a huge thing. Ask anybody if there's any blood in their vomit or stool uh, because GI bleeds um, can slowly kill a person um, depending on like how bad the bleed is or where it's located. So always uh, determine if there's any bleeding or anything in their, in their vomit or stool. Uh, always ask about ulcers. Get a history of like, if they use drugs or alcohol, if they've got some sort of ulcer history. Um, ask them if they have their gallbladder still. Uh, knowing if they don't have a gallbladder will help rule out that they don't have uh, a gallbladder attack. If they don't have an organ in there, then they're not gonna be able to have an issue with it. So if a woman has had a complete hysterectomy and she doesn't have um, those organs in her body anymore, she's not likely to have an issue with those organs. Um, if somebody has already had their appendix removed, then they probably do not have appendicitis. Um, in this chapter, it's going to talk a lot about referred pain. Understand what it means when it talks about referred pain. And there are specific uh, pain and injuries that are resulted with different, uh, or symptoms that are resulted from different injuries, uh, like shoulder pain when it comes to your spleen. Having um, flank pain when you're, you have your kidneys, but then having some sort of like right below the shoulder blade near the spine, people will feel like they're getting poked there but it's actually their gallbladder that's having an attack. So people will have a lot of referred pain because there is a lot of like open space in that body where parts of the organ are attached in certain areas. So it'll affect the area that it's attached to, but not actually where the organ is itself. Um, make sure that you palpate the four quadrants of the abdomen. Um, you want to make sure you cover the whole abdomen, not just feel it once. Uh, I suggest if you guys ever see patients from like here on out, um, if you do like work for a service, and then when you get your, your EMT, 
palpate every single patient's abdomen because you're going to feel normal, 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 and then one person's going to be abnormal, and you're going to know right away that that's not right. That feeling is not right. Um, gynecological conditions that may uh, cause abdominal bleeding or pain. There was a lot of um, diseases or uh, infections that can happen in, in those areas. If they have uh, sexual assault or sexually transmitted diseases, you have to be non-judgmental. You have to, um, even if you don't believe them, they must believe that you believe them. So if there is um, a sexual assault, even if you don't think that the story is adding up, it's not in your place and you need to make it to where they feel that you do believe them, treat them so they can feel like they're being listened to. Um, respect confidentiality and privacy and uh, basically only ask questions that are, are uh, pertinent to the patient care because they're gonna have a whole lot of other questions that are gonna be asked of them when they get to the hospital and then again with law enforcement. Uh, do not allow them to shower or clean um, you have to explain to them that it is in their best interest uh, for when they get to the hospital. Um, it's abdominal injuries. Uh, chapter 27, I covered the behavioral and psychiatric uh, emergencies and suicide. So look over that uh, PowerPoint. Um, it talks a lot about the different AEIOU tips. Um, I have information on there about like suicidal behavior and uh, suicide prevention. Um, there's different links that you can go to if you guys know anybody that is suicidal or if you yourself are suicidal. If somebody is willing to commit suicide, we don't know what else they're willing to do. So it is a significant scene safety concern. Uh, we need to maintain a safe distance while being able to uh, treat our patient and interact with our patient. Someone with suicidal thoughts may talk about killing themselves, feeling hopeless, they don't have any reason to live, um, they have unbearable pain which could be either physical pain or emotional pain. Um, the suicidal behavior may be more risky behaviors, uh, drinking more alcohol, doing more drugs, giving away all their uh, valued possessions, they can become more aggressive and try to push people away because if you don't have anybody that cares about you, it's a lot easier to off yourself. Um, be very direct with these um, with these people. You want to make sure that you actually tell them or like you ask them, are you suicidal? Don't kind of beat around the bush. If they're suicidal, I've said this before, if they're suicidal, they're not going to become suicidal just because you ask them if they're suicidal. Um, make sure you ask if there's a plan. If, they, if, if people plan on how they're going to commit suicide, they're closer to actually committing suicide. Also ask them about a plan for the future because suicidal patients don't always have a plan for the future. So it's kind of a twofer. Um, ask them about how they would commit suicide and if they have the means to do it. Um, there are some legal considerations with um, behavioral patients. It could be false imprisonment, um, false accusations, and then defamation of character. How can you protect yourself about um, with false accusations with a suicidal or behavioral patient? Don't talk about it with other people. How about you being male should try to have a female coworker or a female responder in back with you. Does that make more sense, what I'm looking sure. for? So these people may have some behavioral um, issues and concerns and they don't care about other people's um, livelihood or they may seriously think that something happened to them in the back of the ambulance. So protect yourself from false accusations by putting uh, another person in there with you to be able to observe. So it's at least two against one when they say that the, they were touched inappropriately by the responder. Uh, the defamation is going to be uh, talking about them to other people. Uh, they may try to get 
after you for that. So just making sure that you keep privacy private. And then the false imprisonment, um, we have to go off of their inability to care for themselves. So what kind of consent is that? that implied? Implied. Implied would be if they're unconscious and we assume that they would want help. What was the I condition think, again? What kind of consent is it um, when they are unable to care for themselves? No, I can't think. No, because they they changed the term, but isn't it more like when you are um, going to care for a kid? So implied consent is going to be like uh, like kids. Um, now I can't think of what it is. It's in my head. Well, because they had actually. implied expression and something else. Are you talking about involuntary consent? Yeah. Or involuntary consent, yes. I kept thinking it was something else. They also call it inferred, but involuntary consent. There we go. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> My brain stopped working. Words are hard. Oh, you mean like the Title 47? Like Title 47. So um, they're unable to care for themselves. Title, title 47 can be used for like drugs and alcohol or for psychiatric. They may not make the right decisions for themselves to keep themselves safe. Uh, we use this a lot at um, CSP in Anchorage when I work there. I think it's called ASP now. Um, picking up or housing the intoxicated people because they'll freeze to death on the streets. So they don't have the mental capacity to make the decision to go somewhere warm or to sober up or anything like that. So the involuntary consent. Um, so writing that down or or documenting their inability to care for themselves is what's going to protect you from the false imprisonment. Um, module five exam, it's 50 points, it's about 50 questions. It goes from chapters 22 to 27. Um, everybody able to, to log in and see everything on the My Brady? Are we having any issues with the My Brady right now? Nobody has contacted me and nobody's putting anything in the chat, so. Okay. All right. Any questions about uh, this module that's coming up? Anything else? Uh, there was a question that was brought up about um, one, of the, one of the questions on the exam. Let's see if I can bring it up. I don't know where it is. So one of the questions on the exam talked about um, stroke patients. So the question was, many stroke patients are candidates for thrombolytic drugs. And one of the most important things that an EMT can do to optimize the care of a stroke patient who is a candidate is, and it's what, it, what the answer is, is do, um, determine the exact time of onset. Um, just because they are a candidate doesn't mean that we know they're a candidate. Um, the question is actually kind of poorly written. Uh, let's see if I can bring it up here so you guys can kind of see. I don't, there we go. I can. I don't know if everybody got this question or not. Air screen, come on now. There we go. So determine the exact time of uh, onset of symptoms. Uh, some of those thrombolytics can be in four hours. Some of them are in eight hours, it depends. Um, they do not need to go to a level one trauma center. What they need is a trope center. Um, you're gonna do a thorough physical assessment of them, including your FAST, so faced, arms, speech, and time, um, but 
doing your thorough physical exam is not going to optimize the care of a stroke patient. It's going to give you more information to be able to give to the hospital. And then uh, transporting to the, the operating room, a lot of times they just need to have a CT scan and then the thrombolytic drugs. We don't know if they're going to have to have an operation done. So that's how this question is kind of misleading um, because you think, oh man, I need to go there. They're already labeled as a candidate. But what it's actually asking is, um, what information do we need that will give them the best outcome for if the, if they're a candidate or not? Because if they are way outside the uh, the time frame, or if we don't know if they're outside the time frame, we're not going to be able to get them into the appropriate um, CT scan area. Um, it's a it's a poorly worded question, but I figured I'd let you guys kind of see it. So if you see it, you know what you're looking for. So determine the exact time of onset for the symptoms. All right, that is all I have. Any questions, comments, or snide remarks? Thank you. All right, you guys all have a good night. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank right. you. Thank you, have a good night. Bye. Welcome, thanks. Well, I was laughing at your jokes. <laughs> did I say a bunch of jokes? You did a few. <laughs> I heard a couple of people snickering. Yeah. It is hard though, man. Like <laughs> I definitely feel for you when you ask a question and it's like I wanna like type one of them the answer. <laughs> yeah. I uh, just I couldn't think for the life of me about the involuntary oh. consent. Yeah, it just froze my brain yeah oh there's so many times and i <laughs> i just make the students look it up <laughs> yeah Why you look it up all right well i need to go make dinner for my kids They're yeah i'm gonna i'm gonna finish dinner it's been sitting next to me for the last hour <laughs> oh god <laughs> all right we'll go finish dinner i will talk to you later all right sounds good bye bye